Lovely. Lovely. Well, we want to welcome folks who will be watching this message from Grace United Church in Coombs, British Columbia. Goats on the roof were their famous cousin. Uh, and uh, it is May the 19th, 2024. Sandy's going to read the scripture lesson today. Oh, the scripture is from Mark 7, uh, verses 31 to 37. From Tyre, he went to Sidon, then back to the Sea of Galilee by way of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and everyone begged Jesus to lay hands on the man and heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd and put his fingers into the man's ears, then spat and touched the man's tongue with the saliva. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and commanded, Open! Instantly, the man could hear perfectly and speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to spread the news, but the more he forbade them, the more they made it known. For they were overcome with utter amazement. Again and again, they said, everything he does is wonderful. He even corrects deafness and stammering. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, as I continue in my series on the fruit of the Spirit, I want to look at two stories, uh, one in the Gospel of Mark that you heard and the other in the Gospel of Matthew. Doreen, can you just shut that uh, back door? It just opened up. The Holy Spirit was passing through and... Uh, the door open. And, and in the two stories, one that you've just heard and in the one I'm going to talk about just uh, in a moment or two, each of us tells about this next fruit of the Spirit, which is kindness. And I hope you will see how even small acts of kindness uh, are important in God's kingdom. That first that you heard is this interesting encounter uh, that Jesus had when he was going from the Mediterranean coast town of Tyre into the area where he was more familiar with, which is Galilee. And there's this crowd of people that brought a deaf and not mute, but a person who had a problem with speech impediment. And, I, and the first thing I want to point out is that Jesus' kindness displayed in this particular situation uh, is very personal. You see, when Jesus was asked to heal this man, he was asked by this crowd of people who had brought this man to Jesus. But did you notice who Jesus responds to? It's not really to the crowd, it's actually to the individual man who had those impediments. He doesn't you know, heal immediately right there, although at different other points in the stories we know of Jesus, sometimes he heals with just a word. Sometimes he heals in the midst of the crowd, but in this situation, he's very sensitive to this particular man. And so he takes him away from the crowd, off somewhere where it's just Jesus and himself who are there. Now, why would Jesus do that? Wouldn't he want everyone to see that miracle? I mean, after all, that's an important part, it seems, of, of this word about Jesus' power and who he was, the resurrection and life. You'd think he'd want people to know that, but in this situation, he doesn't heal the man in that crowd. I think perhaps Jesus perceives that no one with a disability likes to be paraded around or be the center of attention. He probably already suffered in previous years from some kind of maybe laughter of people who didn't understand him or kids who teased him at Hebrew school, any number of things that made him perhaps very self-conscious. Maybe Jesus is chewed into the man's wounded psyche and because Jesus is intimately filled with compassion and kindness, he takes this man away so that it can just be this exchange between Jesus and the man in need. Now, the man couldn't hear Jesus speak, and so that's perhaps why we see Jesus touching him more than maybe he would in other places with other people. 
So in that private moment, Jesus takes his fingers and he places them in the man's ears, showing him where he will experience hearing, perhaps, for the very first time in his life. And then Jesus takes some of his own saliva on his fingers and touches the man's tongue. Now, for those of us who are germaphobes, that just sounds terrible and gross, doesn't it? Especially post-COVID. Oh yeah, after COVID it sounds really bad. But in Jesus' day, in actual fact, people felt that if there was a person who was suffering from something like their throat or their tongue, a person who was well, if, if they had saliva and it was placed on the other person's tongue or in their mouth, that they also might have healing. So that's perhaps why it was, you know, something Jesus did. In that act of touching the man's ears and tongue, Jesus assures him that once again, he's going to be able to speak and he will be able to hear. With dignity, respect, and kindness, Jesus makes clear to that man that this moment is all about him. It's all about this man's healing and the power of God. Verse 35 says, at this, the touch and the saliva, the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. So through this act of Jesus' kindness, the man's life was transformed. And in an instant, his world opened up with all sorts of new possibilities. Now, it's a story that invites those of us who follow Jesus to look on other people with compassion, and love and mercy. You know, we're used to the cameras being on people who are famous. You know, Hollywood actresses, actors, famous singers, politicians, you know, and oftentimes those are the people who look like they've got everything together. They have perfect skin, you know, they're tall and dark and handsome or beautiful. And Jesus oftentimes, well, it's certainly in the scriptures, you don't see Jesus going up to the beautiful people. It's never described that way. It's usually the people who have a great need, whether it's a physical disability like this man, whether they have a physical challenge or an emotional breakdown, something. Jesus is always going to the people who the world around doesn't look upon as being very beautiful or whole or having everything together. That's a story to inspire us to be conscious of the people around us who might feel that they're unnoticed, that no one sees them because they have a disability or they have something that they struggle with. And so this act of kindness to this man who'd struggled for probably many years and how Jesus touched him and saw him and knew him intimately and had compassion and kindness upon him, that's part of what Jesus wants to instill for us to see other people and to act with kindness. I want to read another story. This one from Matthew chapter 25. And it's going to be a familiar passage to you because you've heard it before, I'm sure. And, uh, and it talks about small acts of kindness and how God remembers these. It comes in Matthew chapter 25 and Jesus is giving a few parables and this is called the parable of the sheep and goats. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Sheep from the goats. I, <laughs> sheep, goats, it's bad in the church when you do that. Then the king will say to those on his right, apparently, well, it depends on where you are on the right, correct? Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or in 
needing of clothes and give you clothes? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. In this parable, this story that Jesus tells, he ties acts of kindness, small acts of kindness, to eternity. And this passage shows us that God sees and God remembers the acts of kindness that most of us have forgotten long ago. Two groups of people, sheep and groats. And the sheep asked this question, when did we see you hungry or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you in need of clothing or a visit and we came and visited you or brought you clothes? And the king says to the sheep, come you who are blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you. And then he goes through this list of what they've done. Now that phrase, come you who are blessed by my father and inherit the kingdom, that phrase, blessed by the Father, I think is a phrase Jesus uses uh, to remind those who would hear him or read these words later about another more famous passage of scripture where Jesus talks about people who are blessed. Do you remember what that passage of scripture is? The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. That's right. It comes from Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And so Jesus picks up this idea of blessings. It's, quite a, it's a very Hebrew way of talking about uh, how God blesses people. And there's oftentimes associated with curses, but Jesus doesn't use these curses, at least not at this point. It's the blessings. Remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You see, these blessings, these beatitudes, are the things that Jesus say that God honors. This is how we see God blessing people. When they're mourning, God brings comfort to them. When they are meek and humble, God blesses them. When they are searching for righteousness, God meets them with God's righteousness. This is the blessings that come to us as people who are seeking to follow God. The Beatitudes are Jesus' vision of the true shape of God's kingdom and of God's kingdom people. And when we go back to Matthew 25, Jesus says that those who belong to God's kingdom are really the blessed ones who have allowed God to do a deep work in their hearts, first of all. That's important. You see, the natural consequence of being blessed by God, all these blessings, is to participate in acts of kindness and love and mercy that should flow unimpinged from our hearts and our lives, from our hands and our words to the people around us. Because we've experienced that from God, they should just flow naturally to people around. Now I know it's not always that easy. I understand that. But this is, I think, what Jesus' idea of the kingdom is. It is about people who reflect the, the God who has come and made himself known in Jesus and who acts out of kindness and mercy and joy and love and peace. I think it's clear through this parable that Jesus is saying that when we do these random acts of kindness referred to in that passage of Matthew 25, those random acts of kindness and compassion we're not only reflecting the heart of God, but in a very real way, we're expressing kindness back to God. Because that's what Jesus says. When you've done it for one of the least, in actual fact, you're doing that for me, to me. I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of my sisters and brothers of mine, you did it for me. And it's these practices, these attitudes, these character traits, the fruit of the Spirit, that will go on in the age to come when God's kingdom reigns forevermore. When you look around today, sometimes the prevailing attitude is that you just better take care of yourself, number one, or be stingy with your compassion or kindness. This is what Rob calls 
the gospel of goats. Stinginess, looking after number one, you know, don't think about other people around you. The gospel of goats. But this isn't the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this actually doesn't produce a fulfilled life, a joy-filled life, a blessed life. What expands God's kingdom and brings life to us and brings blessings to us is when we unconsciously, unconsciously show compassion, kindness, and extend healing grace to the people around. It's not something that's forced or commanded to do, really, but comes naturally through us because we've experienced God's kindness. We've experienced God's blessings. We've experienced God's goodness in our lives. And so when that's filled our hearts, it naturally is going to flow out from what we say and what we do. How many of you know that this past February 17th was Random Acts of Kindness Day? Random Acts of Kindness Day. Now, there are lots of stories about random acts of kindness, but there's one that I read recently that I really love. It took place uh, a few years back at a McDonald's drive-thru, and uh, it was in Indiana. Maybe you've heard it before. It was Father's Day, and there was a woman who was going through the drive-thru, and uh, she placed her order, and then you know how sometimes if there's a line, if you just move slowly ahead, but she could hear what the person behind was ordering for, he had four kids in the van, and she heard what he was ordering, you know, a couple of Happy Meals, Big Mac, and so on and so forth. And she decided to give him a Father's Day gift. So she went up to pay, and she said, I wanna pay for the person behind me. Would you mind just, you know, tell him when he comes through that it's been paid for, Happy Father's Day. And so she paid his bill, because she knew what it was, and uh, she drove away. Well, that man who was, yeah. Can I just share a local one with that? Well, I'm not finished my story yet. I just wanted to say that that knocked out a whole restaurant. It did it? Uh, someone paid for your meal. At the Truth restaurant. And I think that's someone paid for your meal too, right, Marion and Dave? Yeah. yeah it, no, that's okay. Uh, anyways, so she pays for his meal, and he's so impressed that he decides to pay for the meal behind him. And so if you can believe it, over the next four hours, by the end of the shift, 167 people had paid for the person behind them. That's a great, that's a great thing. And it's wonderful when you're the recipient of that, isn't it there, Sharon? It's a real surprise. It's a surprise for sure. But you think, wow, they didn't have to do that. They don't know me from Adam, but they did it. What a simple act of random kindness. Now, why do I mention random acts of kindness? Because I know that none of us keeps count of the small or even large acts of compassion compassion and kindness we've done over the years. But Jesus gives this clear impression through this parable that God keeps track of what we've done when it comes to random acts of kindness. So I decided to take this parable of Jesus and kind of extend the main idea into my first day in heaven. Whenever that happens, Connie will be fine down here, I expect, that's true. But my first day in heaven, I'm taking this this kind of parable and kind of imagining what it might be like. Now, when I get there, of course, I'm thankful I'm going to see some people that I love and know who've gone before me, and I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to thank him for all he's done in my life. And I think I might want to impress Jesus a little bit. And so I'm going to say, Jesus, do you remember... First pastoral charge in Lillooet, we got there. We were, you know, four, three kids, four kids? We only have three. (laughs) Three kids in the manse, blistering hot. And do you remember, Jesus, I got my picture on the front page of the Bridge River Lillooet News. Wow, was I a big shot in town. You know, I was going to change the kingdom of Lillooet into the kingdom of God. Jesus says, hmm, I think I must have missed that edition. Didn't see the picture. But I do remember how you befriended Reg. Remember Reg? He said that his office was at the local dump. He didn't have very much, but you befriended him. Your family, you know, helped him out. That's what I remember. Hmm, 
Okay, Jesus, what about Christmas Eve? 2006, Metropolitan United Church back in London, the largest United Church in Canada, the pews were filled. I was on fire. There was a beautiful choir. Do you remember that? Ah, oh, Jesus says, hmm, oh, yeah, that was a good service. But you know what I really remember? I remember how the folks that met, you were there too. Every Friday night, they had this hospitality meal where they fed, you know, a hundred or more people who were staying at the shelters. That really got me. I remember that. Hmm. Striking out. Well, Jesus, don't you remember that I've got a couple of degrees? I was president of the class at VST for a few years. Like, hello there. Plus, I'm, you know, the minister at Coombs United Church. How can you forget that, Jesus, right? Hmm, Jesus might respond, I'm sure that's quite an accomplishment, Ed, but what I do remember is when you stop to talk with a person in their time of loss or need and help them through this rough patch. That's what I remember. You see, I think part of the message of Jesus in this passage from Matthew's Gospel is that the things we think God should be concerned about, our resumes, our extravagant acts of generosity or our accomplishments, not that they aren't good or important, they are, of course, in lots of ways to us and to people around us. But that's not what God is really interested in. What's more important and what God really values are the small acts of kindness. When you helped someone find food when they were hungry, when you visited someone in prison or in the hospital or a care facility, when you gave a stranger some hope by helping them out or listening to them, when you gave someone warm clothes and looked after a person in their time of sickness or loss. You see, those things that we just do naturally, I hope, and we forget about them. God doesn't forget. God doesn't forget them. Jesus says he remembers them. God will remember even the little acts that you've forgotten because what will matter is whether in your life you've allowed God's spirit to work through your acts of kindness and love that you didn't think much about, but in actual fact were a ministry to God himself. See, that's what Jesus says. When you did it to one of the least, you did it for me. And so those random acts of kindness you don't even think about, in actual fact, Jesus says you did it for me. I once read an interview between Mother Teresa and a reporter. When she was asked how many times she would meet Jesus in a day, she said this, I see Jesus once in the morning when I have devotion with the Lord. For the rest of the day, I meet him many times through the faces of the needy people in the streets of Calcutta. I believe that's how we respond with the unconscious acts of kindness. We see Jesus in the faces of the people around us and if there's a need or if we're sensitive to the Spirit, you know, we're able to give them a word of encouragement or help them out or give them a hug or whatever it is. We do that, I hope, unconsciously. So why does this matter to Jesus? Because for most people, they'll never meet God apart from an act of kindness, love, and sacrifice that might be shown to them by a believer. They may never, ever experience God's love and grace and compassion and kindness unless it happens through you, through me, or through millions of other people who are trying to follow God. Now we know that not everyone will be open to God's spirit, but most people remember an act of kindness shown to them. And even if you forget it a few hours later, but it made a difference to them and it makes a difference to God. And that is evidence that the fruit of kindness is experienced and exhibited in what you do over and over again, every week. God remembers those things. Jesus remembers them. And when you do that, you're growing to be more and more like Jesus every week. Amen.